I want to take just a moment to uh, thoroughly embarrass somebody. Most Sundays you see him up here in the choir. During the week you'll find him in various places around our campus. He's a jack of many trades. He has a creative side to him that uh, blesses our church in ways I don't think most of you even are aware of. Many of you who've had special services like what we're having today, an ordination service, have benefited from the fact that he has a, a skill in calligraphy and does beautiful work. He makes his way around a facility that presents lots and lots of challenges and has jobs you don't want to hear about on a Sunday morning. He's the kind of person, maybe you know some of these kind of people, if, if that person isn't around, you can panic. Because you know what that person brings, the value that that person produces. Whenever he leaves his place of work, he leaves behind um, sort of his uh, standard uh, saying, if you will, he will tell us whether he's gone for an hour or for a day or maybe a week, he'll say, don't break anything. <laughs> Stephen Bradley is a member of Wyuka Road Baptist Church. He and his family have been here for a long, long time. In about a month, he'll stand beside his son here at this altar as his son is wed to Brittany. Stephen has worked for 10 years here and makes a difference in the way in which he works. And so whether you find him up in his cubby hole, surrounded by the tools of his trade, or walking through the walls of this church, patting the walls and saying, please be nice, please, please be nice, Stephen Bradley has made a difference at Waiuka. And I want to express my personal appreciation to him. And I want to recognize him uh, today and ask him to stand. Stephen, would you do that? I'll probably pay for that. <laughs> He'll do something in my office or something. Lord, listen to your children praying. I hope this, these last several weeks have seen you on your knees more, in, your wor in the Word more, bringing to God not just things that are suggested, but things that He places in your mind or in your heart. Because I think you know that prayer is such an amazing gift. It's a shame we don't, we don't pray more often, more sincerely, more specifically. Because when we're talking to God, we're talking to someone who loves us more than we can imagine. And who knows everything there is to know about what's happening in our lives. You're not going to tell him anything he doesn't know. But just like when you're with someone that you deeply care about and they deeply care about you, time doesn't matter. What you got to do next doesn't matter. This, those moments are precious. And I hope you're using those moments. And if you're not, please, please consider doing that. The spiritual uh, guides, the season of prayer guides are still available. And we'd love for you to pick one up. You can catch up with all that uh, this congregation has been praying about. And if you're not a member of this church, we'd love to have you pray for us. But maybe you ought to enter into your own season of prayer because I, I know for sure that you have things in your life that you need to pray about. So I encourage you to do that. The theme of this time together, Lord, listen to your children praying, is an opening of our lives, a willingness to have that conversation with God. And request of him that he send us what we need. He invites us to his throne of grace. He invites us to tell him what we desire. Again and again in scripture. Tell him what you need. Give him thanks for all he has done. And trust him. Last week we talked about 
the importance of the Spirit coming into our lives. Certainly there's a personal sense of that. When I invite Christ in my life, I don't get God part one or two or three. I get God. But there are those moments as a person or as a people when we need the Spirit of God to descend upon us. So, Lord, send us your Spirit. Send him in this place, wherever that place might be. And it may be in the center of your heart. Lord, send us love. I want you to listen. This uh, passage is a familiar one to many of you, I'm sure, but it comes out of Paul's letter to the Corinthians. He was writing to a church that needed to recalibrate. They needed to return to some things that were primary because they had settled on the secondary. And even gone deeper or further than that because they weren't paying attention to the things that matter the most. So Paul opens this beautiful passage with this, this word of instruction. I want to show you a better way. This is from the J.B. Phillips uh, version of the New Testament. It's in your message notes today. You may have in your Bible those passages that describe this love that Paul says ought to be at the foundation of all of our relationships, certainly as we think about our relationship with God. Listen to this kind of love and think about the way you and I live. Love is slow to lose patience. It looks for a way of being constructive. It is not possessive. It neither is uh, anxious to impress, nor does it cherish inflated ideas of its own importance. Love has good manners and does not pursue selfish advantage. It's not touchy. It does not keep account of evil or gloat over the wickedness of other people. On the contrary, it shares the joy of those who live by the truth. Love knows no limit to its endurance, no end to its trust, no fading of its hope. It can outlast anything. Love never fails. It is the one thing that still stands when all else is fallen. What would happen to our world with such a love? Friday was a hard day, wasn't it? 14 years ago. A tragedy that not only changed the way we live in America, but it changed the world. It didn't put love on display, it put evil and hatred on display. A few years ago, four Americans died in Benghazi, and those families also had a rough day on Friday. So how do we respond to the evil and the hatred in the world? Let me show you a more excellent way, Paul says. What would happen to a world that operated like this? What would happen in your life if every relationship you have was overwhelmed by this love? We live here as a church and for many way, in many ways we're much alike, but there is still great difference and uniqueness what is it that binds us together? We don't all live within a block of here. We haven't all been coming here all, you know, for all of our lives and know everybody. What is it that holds us together? What is it that is our bind? If it isn't the love of God, if it isn't that love which sends us to love others as we are loved, then I'm not sure we have a good enough reason to gather together. Because if we just want to get together, we can go to the football stadium or the social club. We can find that in our neighborhoods or even in our companies, in our schools. We can find ways to gather together. But there's something unique about the people of God 
And the opportunity to allow the love of God to shape us and form us, to gather us and scatter us so that he can use us in this world. Because there's a message that needs to be stronger than the messages of evil and hatred and prejudice and racism and all of those things that diminish our souls. Paul wrote to the Romans, these words of advice don't just pretend to love others. Really love them, hate what is wrong, stand on the side of the good, love each other with genuine affection, and take delight in honoring each other. When's the last time you were really, really glad when something really, really good happened to somebody that you know. That really, really good thing that happened to that person might even have been at your expense. You know that job you wanted that she got? That recognition you thought you deserved but it went to someone else? Could you really be happy for some, someone other than yourself when good things happen? There's something about the spirit of love that helps us to overcome those times when we're apprehensive, those times when we're envious, those times when we're small and petty. And it isn't a love that I manufacture, it's a love that descends, that God sends our way. God's been doing that from the very beginning. It's one of the reasons why some scientists have such a, have a problem with the whole idea of creation because they don't understand that ultimately Creation is an act of love. And that from that moment on, God so loved the world that he continued to give until ultimately he wrapped love in swaddling clothes, laid him in a manger, sent him to the cross to die to carry your sins and mine. The essence of love is sacrifice. Doing something for someone else because it's the right thing to do. It's the thing we're created to do. We have his example before us. Jesus says to his disciples in those last words before he goes to the cross, he says to them, I have loved you even as the Father has loved me. I command you, love one another. And if you, know what it, if you want to know what it looks like, here it is. The greatest love is when someone is willing to lay down his life for his friends. The Apostle John laid in his life. He looks around at a world that's not too fond of Christians. Persecution is at an all-time high. He himself has felt it. Most of his brothers are already dead because of their martyrdom. Those who gathered around Jesus during those three years of ministry and preparation for mission. He's about the last one left of the group. And what does he talk about? The bitterness of being unfairly treated, the hard times of struggling when you thought by serving God, he would certainly help you and bless you in, in ways that you thought would be more apparent. No, he... He spends some of his last days writing words like this. We know how much God loves us. And we have put our trust in him. God is love. And all who live in love live in God and God lives in them. And as we live in God, our love grows more perfect. Such love has no fear because perfect love expels all fear. You know the two, two of the things that trouble people the most these days? The first is suffering. Particularly suffering that seems so unfair. The losses that we experience that we can't explain, the, the pain that we go through that have, has no, no explanation. That's the first, suffering. You know what the second one is? Fear. We live in a world that can scare us to death, can't it? If we allow it. So how do we combat fear? 
Well, I know how we're supposed to combat fear. We fortify our homes. We make sure that nobody can do it, get to us. We protect ourselves every way we possibly can. How is that working? Not too well. No, there's a better way. Perfect love casts out fear. Jesus says, don't be afraid of those who can take your body. Be afraid of those who could take your soul. Because at the soul level, some things happen. Some amazing things happen. Let's talk about us for just a minute. There are two types of people, some say, in the world. And there are two ways to treat people in the world. The first way to treat people in the world is to bless people. The second way to treat people in the world is to curse people. And again, throughout scripture, you can find evidences of both. Let's, let's, focus, let's focus on blessing. When you drive in the traffic of the city of Atlanta, are you more likely to bless or to curse? Now, curse is not necessarily words of profanity or, you know, that sort of thing. Curse is a, is a glare. It's a hard word. It could be any number of things. If you're a, if you're a major league blesser, and I better not ask you to raise your hands because then I got to go to major league cusser or cursor or whatever. I'm not going to go there. But I want you to see the difference in the way in which we live in this world. In one of the oldest blessings in existence, God told Aaron, the brother of Moses, to bless the people of Israel. Now, if you know much about the, the history, particularly as it relates to Moses and Aaron and that era in the life of the Jews, you'll know that this was a stiff-necked, stubborn, rebellious, complaining, griping group of people. They even got to the place when, when things got a little challenging, they would say to Moses, why did you bring us out here? We've been better off as slaves in Egypt. And Moses is going, what did I do to deserve this? So what is God's response? I want you to bless these people. You can find this in Numbers chapter 6. But I would imagine you've heard these words before. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. To bless. To bless is to bring good in someone else's life or to recognize the good and celebrate it. To keep, to protect all that is sacred and precious. To make his face shine upon you. You ever watched a mother as she gazes upon her child when that child does something really cute, adorable, like some of what we saw up here this morning? Your face lights up. When God looks at you, his child, his face lights up. He wants his face to shine. Because to shine is to show the glory of joy and pleasure. To make his face shine upon you. To lift his countenance. You know what that means? If someone lifts his countenance to you, that means they're paying attention to you. We've all watched people who are distracted, who are thinking about other things, or busy about other stuff. But in that moment when they look up and they fix eyes on you, you know that they've lifted their countenance to you. God, lift your countenance to us. Pay attention to us. We need you. We need you to give us peace. Not the cessation of hostilities or some temporary truce, but that unthreatened, undisturbed well-being that sees us through whatever comes. To bless is to love someone with your soul. And that soul is this amazing combination of the will and the mind and the body. Love the Lord your God with all you are. Your heart, soul, and strength, all that you are. 
We as people of faith must live that kind of life. And we're giving, given examples of that throughout Scripture. And I need to rush here. And I want to, I want to take you to a picture in the New Testament. The early church started out, there's so much excitement, there's so much energy. People were attracted to the, not just the message, but the lifestyle of these people who's, who seemed to have been changed somehow. They wanted to know more about it. They wanted to be a part of it. And so people flocked to them. But it didn't take long. Acts chapter 6, verse 1, as the believers rapidly multiplied, there were rumblings of discontent. I know, hard to believe in a church, people who aren't happy. I understand. Those who spoke Greek complained against those who spoke Hebrew, saying that their widows were being discriminated against in the daily distribution of food. It was a very practical problem. You have that with groups of people. You have that in churches and other organizations. You know why? There are no perfect churches. Because none of us could belong to them. They're none of us who are perfect. The problem was that some of the folks who weren't from around there, but who had come to Jerusalem and had been attracted by this movement and wanted to be a part of it, felt left out. And most of us have had experiences in church where we felt left out. We didn't know the right people or we didn't come to the right activity. We, we, some of us can get that because the church can hurt us pretty seriously. So they came to the apostles and they said, this isn't fair. The apostles could have gone into a long line of, here's the reason for this and this and that. Instead of that, they decided that there was a practical way to approach it. But it was a practical way driven by love. Those persons, whether they speak Greek or Hebrew, are as important as anybody else. And we're going to take care of them. And we're going to appoint some folks to do that. And throughout the Bible, you'll see that particularly in the New Testament, you'll see men and women who are appointed for special service, who are set apart to take care of the family. And here, for the very first time, we have what we call deacons show up in Scripture. But I want you to think about this. It, it, it could have been simply an occasion for complaint, but it turned into an opportunity for ministry. And out of that, it was an ordination of service. It was setting apart those who had shown themselves to be worthy of a task. And it's so interesting to me that the task was waiting on tables. So what were their qualifications? They were well-respected. They were full of the Holy Spirit. They were wise. And they were willing to wait tables. Do they sound overqualified to you? I heard our deacon chair, Ben Jones, say to the deacons retreat yesterday, none of, us, none of us in this room feel like we're qualified to do what we've been asked to do. I love that spirit of humility because it's true for any one of us who seek to lead, to minister in the name of Christ. It isn't because God can't do without us, but it's because we've made ourselves available and let him do the heavy lifting here are a group of people who said, count on me, I'll do it. This morning there are six who have said, count on me, I'll do it. Whatever it takes, I'll do it. I'll help take care of the families in this church. I'll help serve this church. It's a wonderful spirit. And it indicates the way things ought to be when we genuinely care for each other and do what it takes to demonstrate love. I don't think I can do this justice, but I'm going to try. <clears throat> Some of you will remember the name Derek Redman. Derek was a, an Olympic athlete for Great Britain. He was an astounding athlete. As a 19-year-old, he shattered the British record for one of the most exciting races uh, that you see in the Olympic Games, a 400-meter race. He was supposed to run in the Seoul Olympics in 88. But he had an Achilles tendon injury. And in the next year, he had five surgeries. It looked like his career was over. But he wasn't finished. And he kept training and he kept training. And he wanted to run in the Olympic Games. And he got his chance in Barcelona in 1992. He would qualified for one of the semifinal heats. It's interesting that he and his father traveled to all these competitions. His dad was his biggest fan. 
And they talk about strategies and they talk about how to take care of himself, you know, make sure that he warmed up properly, all that stuff. And he talked about how great it would be for him to compete at that high level against the world's greatest athletes. So he was, he was fired up. The morning of the race, they sat down one more time just to talk over things. And his dad told him, I'll be there. You know I will. I'm always there. When the race started, Derek blasted out of the blocks. He was, he was in the lead. At 175 meters, he felt a pop in his right leg, his hamstrung. Ham, hamstrings uh, was torn. Some of you remember that because you saw it. First thing he did is he crumpled to the track. And then he tried to get up. And he tried to walk. He couldn't walk very well. He tried to hop. He couldn't hop very well. There were people all around him, officials, that came running toward him to try to get him to stop because he was obviously hurt. Well, just before the race, his dad, Jim, had gone to the very top of the Olympic Stadium, not far from where the Olympic torch had been lit just days before. And he saw all this unfold. But he didn't sit there. He got up and he started running down those steps. And he had to sidestep some people. He had to push through some people. And he got down to the track and the security people were saying, no, 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 you're not allowed here. And they wouldn't allow him to come. They just didn't know Jim Redmond because he was not to be denied. By now, his son Derek was limping badly, tears streaming down his face. The race was already over. The U.S. runner had won that heat. But every eye in that stadium was not on the finish line. It was on that spot on a track where a young athlete was obviously in distress. The medical team came up with a stretcher. They tried to get him on it. He wouldn't go. I got to finish what I started. All of a sudden, he felt these strong arms around his neck and shoulder. It was his dad. Derek's pain was was awful. His dad knew that what they had promised each other, they'd have to see through. So Jim Redmond said to his son, I'm here, son. We'll finish together. And so they started down the track in his lane toward the finish line. The crowd that day began to cheer. And the crowd cheered louder and louder and louder as they saw this human drama unfold, as they saw love displayed that overcomes every obstacle. And just before they got to the finish line, wrapped up in each other's arms, Jim Redmond let go so his son could finish the race on his own. As you can imagine, they were, there was a deluge of requests for interviews. And in one particular one, this is what Jim Redmond said. I'm the proudest father alive. I'm prouder of him than I would have been if he had won the gold medal. It took a lot of guts for him to do what he did. Certainly true, Jim Redmond. And it took a lot of love for you to do what you did. We make a choice in life to give in to the fear, to bow before the suffering, to turn to hatred or to evil. Or there is a more excellent way, a way that's demonstrated by those who understand grace and mercy and most of all love. Will you pray with me? Father, life isn't easy. Some of us in this room today are just really beat up. We don't see a whole lot of love in our lives because there's not too many people showing it to us. But Lord, we have a choice. Even in the midst of the obstacles, the challenges that are thrown in our way, we can still learn, look to you. Bask in your love and try to find ways to let that love you send us be seen in our lives. 
And now in these moments, these closing moments, I pray that you would, you would bless us as we bless six people who have surrendered themselves to be of service to your family here at Wayuka. So we ask your blessings now in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to take a few moments. Today I want these individuals to stand so that you'll know who they are if you don't. And then we're going to have a scripture reading and a prayer. And then I'm going to ask those six candidates to move to places in our sanctuary. And I want you to come to them. And there may be someone you have a special relationship with, so you'll go to that person. And you're going to lay hands on and you're going to bless that person because you want to help them begin their ministry with an affirmation. So I want to introduce these folks and ask them to stand as I read their names so you'll know who they are. Sherry Abney. She's right back here. Mark Clark. Jisha. Obukwe-Lu, I always struggle with that. Obukwe-Lu, Jisha, where are you? Right there. Helen Phillips. Davis Scholes. And Kali Sugg. Thank you. You, might, you may be seated for just a moment. As Ben and Grace come to lead us in this portion of our service, in just a moment we will put our candidates in these various places and ask you to bring blessing into their lives. So Ben, if you will, come and lead us in prayer and then Grace Freeman, or excuse me, in scripture and Grace will lead us in prayer. I'm reading from Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. Is there any such thing as Christians cheering each other up? Do you love me enough to want to help me? Does it mean anything to you that we are brothers in the Lord sharing the same spirit? Are your hearts tender and sympathetic at all? Then make me truly happy by loving each other and agreeing wholeheartedly with each other, working together with one heart and mind and purpose. Don't be selfish. Don't live to make a good impression on others. Be humble thinking of others as better than yourself. Don't just think about your own affairs, but be interested in others too and in what they are doing. Your attitude should be kind, be the kind that was shown, by, shown us by Christ Jesus, who though he was God, did not demand and cling to his rights as God, but laid aside his mighty power and glory taking the disguise of a slave and becoming like men. And he humbled himself even further, going so far as actually to die a criminal's death on a cross. Yet it was because of this that God raised him up to the heights of heaven and gave him a name which is above every other name, that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God. Will you pray with me? We thank you, Lord God, that in your great love you sent Jesus Christ to take the form of a servant. You have taught us by his word and example that whoever would be great among us must be servant of all. Give these servants grace to be faithful to their promises, constant in their discipleship, and always ready for the works of loving service. Make them modest and humble gentle and strong, rooted and grounded in love. Give them a share in the ministry of Jesus Christ so they can love, so they can give, so they can share, 
and so they can minister to be your hands and your feet to those that are in need. Amen. And now I'd like to ask our candidates, if they would, to take their places. Uh, Sherry Abney will be here at the break in the uh, pews. Jisha will be in the center. Davis will be over to this side. Uh, here in the front, um, we'll have um, Helen will be here in the center. Um, Mark Clark over here and Collie over here. This is what I request of you, and that is that as you look at these individuals, if there again is a special connection between you and that person, they need to feel your touch and you offer a brief prayer, silently if you choose, but we are gonna use these moments to bless these folks uh, who have uh, allowed themselves and have responded to your call to be a part of the deacon ministry. So of our candidates would please make their way to their places And now, church, these stand before you. May we bless each of them as you see fit. Come, let us bless them.